Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. So we'll be uh, working on part two of this paper. So let's get started. Question 11, a ball is at rest at the top of a hill. All right, so, okay, so the ball starts at the top of a hill and then uh, it rolls down the hill and it's stopped by a wall. So what are the energy changes? Generally speaking, you can always use the elimination method to go on with these type of questions. So you know you're at the top of a hill, so obviously C and D are cancelled from the start. So now you're thinking, is it A or B? But then you notice that the ball is moving, so then that um, equates to kinetic energy. So then B would be the answer. So question 12. A student cycles along a level road at a speed of 5 meters per second. The total mass of the student and the bicycle is 120 kilograms. The student applies the brakes and stops. The braking distance is 10 meters. What is the average braking force? So when you see braking distance, you're going to um, equate that with the work uh, energy theorem or work kinetic energy theorem. Okay. So basically that is work is equal to the change in kinetic energy and kinetic change in kinetic energy is the final kinetic energy minus the initial, right? And work is equal to force times the distance in which that force is occurring, right? So let's see, what do we have? We have distance, which is 10. We have the final kinetic energy, which is zero because it comes to a stop and the initial kinetic energy we can actually find because kinetic energy is just so wait let's let's do that right now so we have zero and then this is half mv squared that's the formula for kinetic energy so force is equal to sorry so force times distance is equal to negative half mv squared right so force, uh, we're going to move the distance, bring it down here. So we're going to divide by distance is half mv squared divided by distance, or you can write it as mv squared over d, 2d. Okay, this negative is not important because we're looking at the magnitude. We're not looking for the direction or anything like that. Um, so that's what we're dealing with right now. All you got to do is substitute the values, so 120 times 5 squared, 5.0 squared, over 2 times the distance, which is 10, will give you 150 newtons. Okay, and then that's your answer. So let's move on now. Okay, so question 13. A water manometer is connected to a gas supply. Okay, there is a gas leak and the pressure of the gas supply falls, so there is less pressure. Um, that I don't know what that was, <laughs> but there's less pressure. So what happens to the water level at P? What happens to the water level at Q? So if there's less pressure, that means it can push the water less. Its ability to uh, add some sort of pressure to this water is less. So P would be a little bit higher, right? It's going to rise. So if it rises, that means that Q will drop. Because we're not changing the number of water molecules, it's the same amount of water. So if it goes up, then that side has to go down and vice versa. So C is your answer. Now for question 14, a submarine is 20 meters below the surface of the sea. The pressure due to the water at this depth is P. Okay, now you got 20 meters right here. On another day, the submarine is 26 meters below the surface of fresh water. The density of seawater is 1.3 times the density of fresh water. Okay, so we have this formula. Pressure is equal to density times the uh, gravitational acceleration times H, which is depth. Okay, so let's start with the pressure um, in the seawater. So the pressure in the seawater Right, so SW for seawater is equal to the density of the sea. So the density of seawater is 1.3 times the density of fresh water. So 1.3 times density, this is rho, which is density of fresh water. K okay, times G and times H or the depth, which is 20. Okay, so now we have that, but then we also want the pressure of the fresh water because that's what we're trying to find, anyways, right? And that is just the pressure of the fresh water, right? 
times g times 26. And we know that the density of the seawater is 1.3 times the density of, this, of the fresh water. Okay, so what we can do right now is make this the subject of the formula, so the pressure of fresh water. Because we already know what the pressure of the salt water is, which is just P. Okay, so let's do that. So the pressure of fresh water, or sorry, the density, the density of fresh water, um, instead of rho, I'm going to just use D for density because it's just, it can get confusing at times, especially with my handwriting right now. So, so the density of the fresh water is equal to pressure of salt water over 1.3 G20. Right? We just divide the whole thing by that on both sides. And you can substitute this with just the letter P if you want. So we can do that right now and just place P. Okay? So we're going to take this entire thing and substitute it in here. Right? So then pressure of fresh water is equal to P over 1.3 G20. Okay? times g times 26. Now, you'll see that we can cross off the g. There you go. And just move down a bit. Okay, so then pressure of fresh water is equal to 26p over 1.3 times 20. And 1.3 times 20 is just 26, so 26p over 26 is just P. So it turns out the pressure uh, due to the fresh water at a depth of 26 meters is the same pressure um, that the submarine uh, is subjected to at a depth of 20 meters in seawater. Okay, so let's move on to question 15. A cylinder with a tap, with a tap contains a fixed mass of gas X. So it's fixed. That's pretty important. The gas is contained by a piston, which can move freely towards or away from the tap. When the tap is open, the piston moves slightly to the right towards the tap. So it's moving this way. Okay. What can be deduced about the pressure of gas X? Okay. So before we open the tap, the pressure of gas X is more than that of that than is more than that of the atmospheric pressure. That's because pressure is inversely proportional to volume. You see, the volume here is much smaller as compared to here, so the particles on this area don't really, um, aren't really exposed to a lot of pressure, whereas gas X is exposed to more pressure, right? And then after opening the tab, because the piston can move freely, equilibrium does occur, and then the pressure on both sides are the same. So pressure of gas X is equal to now the pressure of the atmosphere. So question 16, liquid evaporates from a beaker. What happens to the temperature of the remaining liquid and how does this temperature change affect the rate of evaporation? So general definition of temperature, it's a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles, right? The particles in an object. When temperature increases, the motion of these particles also increase. Now, they told us that liquid evaporates from this beaker, and because the liquid evaporated, that means that the average kinetic energy decreased. Um, there are less particles, and thus the kinetic energy would decrease, right? So then, if the kinetic energy or the average kinetic energy has decreased, and the and then you know, uh, accordingly, the temperature has decreased, that means the rate of evaporation will also decrease because rate of evaporation does depend on temperature, right? And that is it for question 16. So then, yeah, your answer is A. Okay, so which quantity does not change when there is an increase in temperature? It does not. So when there's an increase in temperature, in temperature, you know, a lot of things do expand. So B and C are out right away. The diameter, the length, all that's out. But then also the density is out because density depends on mass and volume. Mass is not affected, right? When we start to get really warm, does our mass change? Like, no, that doesn't happen. But the volume does. Because 
as the temperature increases, volume will increase. There is some sort of expansion, and when volume increases, density will decrease because density is inversely proportional to volume. So your answer is D. Now, question 18, your thermocouple is used to measure temperature. What is the advantage of using that instead of a liquid in glass temperature, thermometer, sorry. So the answer is B, because it can measure temperature that changes rapidly. Um, I'm going to link down a 50 second video, it's pretty short, uh, that gives you an overview of what a thermocouple is and how it works. So question 19. You know, you got to make sure you're aware of the advantages and all the different types of thermometers there are for your exam. Okay, so for question 19, a block of copper has a mass of 2 kilograms, okay? 2 kilograms. And it absorbs 12,000 joules of thermal energy. The specific heat capacity of copper is 385 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. What is the temperature rise of the copper? So this is the formula that... Um, brings them all together, all these quantities that we have. So uh, what we're looking for is the change in temperature, right? Or the temperature rise. So we're going to divide the entire thing by mass times the specific heat capacity. Delta T is equal to Q over MC. All right, so now let's just substitute in the values. So 12,000 joules over 2.0 kilograms times 385 joules per kilogram degrees celsius per kilogram degrees celsius this per kilogram degrees celsius will end up coming up will end up coming up here um if you want to do it like the long way basically so then that would be i'm going to just place it up there then kilograms degrees celsius so now you can start canceling things out. So units are really important. So in our case, we didn't have to convert anything, but here's what it looks like. So joules and joules cancel out, kilogram, kilogram cancel out, and you end up with degrees Celsius, which is what we want. Okay, so if you place that in your calculator, 12,000 over 2 times 385 will give you 15.584415 recurring. Okay, so all we have to do is round it up to 15.6 degrees Celsius. Okay, so now for the last question for this video. So a teacher demonstrates an experiment to a class. A boiling tube is filled with water and some ice cubes are trapped at the bottom of the tube. The teacher then heats the boiling tube in the position shown until the water at the top boils. So what does this tell you, right? The ice didn't melt and why not though, right? So that just tells you that water is a poor conductor of thermal energy. Now, we're saying conductor and not convector because um, it's in contact with the ice, yet the ice did not melt. So that just tells you it does not conduct thermal energy well. All right, so that's it for this video. I hope you guys found it helpful. Stay tuned for part three and four of this paper, and I wish you guys the best of luck in your exams, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.